promise this talk is going to be as exciting as the Mario Kart and the Williams talk, but uh, I guess we'll try and see how it goes. Um, I've got kind of a ton of stuff, so um, I'm going to try and rip through a lot of it pretty quickly, and if there's interest in focusing on one thing or another, let me know and try to do that. Um, so I assume everyone here knows Joint, at least as stewards of Node.js, as leaders in the Node.js community. Does anybody know what else Joint does, like how we actually like make money? Okay, some, some people do. Um, we run the Joint public cloud. That's, that's kind of our big service that we run. This is an infrastructure as a service cloud, um, you know, similar to Amazon's EC2. You walk up to an API, you say, I want to provision some machine. You get back something which is a virtual server you can SSH into. You can provision a lot of these. You can deprovision them, scale up and down. It's the cloud, right? Um, we also take the software that runs the joint public cloud, and that actually is a, is a sort of coherent software product called Smart Data Center, which we also allow people to run private clouds with. That's one of our main, so, so Smart Data Center and its main deployment in the joint public cloud is one of our main experiences deploying Node.js in production. The other one that I'm going to be talking from today, and this is where more of my experience lies, is with our Manta service. So Manta is a service that we launched in uh, June or July this year which uh, allows, it's a data storage service, similar to Amazon's S3, but with the twist that we also let you run compute inside the object store. So you can store, say, a thousand log files in Manta, and those are represented over HTTP, and then you want to grep over those files. Instead of downloading each of those things and running grep locally on some machine, you actually just tell the object store, hey, I want to run grep foo on these thousand objects, and you just go do it on the physical servers where the data is stored and store the results of that back in the object store. So that's where a lot of my experience comes from. Um, I, I worked on specifically the job execution part of that. Um, when, so, okay, when software is in production, um, when things are fine, things are fine. The, the thing that sucks is when they go sideways, right? So the theme of this talk is really more how we observe Node.js in production. And I phrased the title this way because, I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I personally hate talks that are super prescriptive about like, here's what you should do, because inevitably, it doesn't, something doesn't match my experience and I don't know how to evaluate that. I don't know like, whether I should completely disregard everything else or what. So my goal here is to talk about what we do do and let you decide how much of that applies, how much of that is just a useful idea that you're not gonna actually take that advice or whatever. So that's why I phrase it this way. Um, okay, talked about Node.js, talked about JPC, Smart Data Center, and Manta. Um, what are the first principles here? I think this is gonna be pretty non-controversial. When you have a problem in production, there are two things you want to do. The first thing is you want to restore production service immediately, right? Because customers are down, you're, it's probably costing you money, that's a problem. But the other thing you want to do is root cause the problem, ideally the first time it happens. And this is something that I think everyone agrees would be a good thing, but I think there's disagreement about how important that is. And indeed, these are clearly intention, right? Because a lot of times you can just bounce the service, it comes back up, everyone's happy, and you have no idea what happened, and you know you're gonna get called tomorrow night, or next week, or next month. In a case that I'll talk about in a few minutes, six months later. And that's, it's kind of this nightmare, I don't know about you, but it's a nightmare for me, lurking in my head. It's like, there's that problem that we never fully understood, it's gonna bite us at some point. Um, so this is a real important goal for us. This is something we really strive for. And a lot of the tooling and, and stuff that I'm going to be talking about today is designed around these two things. We really want to be able to root cause the problem fully the first time we see an infection. And we can't always do it, but that's the goal. Okay, so obviously that's easier said than done. I think everyone probably knows this. How many people here um, work at least hands-on a little bit with a production service of some kind? Have logged into or do log into production boxes to figure out what's going on with okay. It's most people here. Um, there are a lot of constraints on the problem, right? It's not easy to edit code and restart the service. Um, in JavaScript, you can actually do that, but it still ends up being a nightmare of managing those changes and making sure that you actually make that change back in, in the code base so that you don't deploy something two weeks later that didn't have the fix that you put in production here. There's also a deeper problem with that, though, which is that you often mask the very problem you're trying to debug. A lot of the problems that at least I've seen with our services is a situation where you make a request to some service, and it gives you a 503 saying, uh, you know, it just tells the user some stupid error, some, some you know, internal error. Internally, it says, oh, I failed to contact such and such service. I, could, I failed to contact the auth service. But the reason it failed to contact the auth service might be that um, it has an old IP address for it, it hasn't done a DNS lookup in a while, or it actually connected to it and it failed, and that could be a problem with the client code or the server code. It could be that the server's down, it could be any of these things. But a lot of times it's actually a problem in the client. The client has just like not retried in a while. And if you restart the service, the problem goes away. 
And so editing the, the software to cause it to like add a print statement and then restarting the service doesn't work because now you don't know what the problem was. Um, similarly, you can't necessarily stop and attach the debugger, right? It's very disruptive to attach um, like a GDB or the node debugger or something to a service that's actually servicing, you know, some large number of requests per second. It has a huge impact on latency. And hopefully this is not controversial, does this match people's experience? It's definitely a big thing for us. The other problem is that most traditional debuggers don't know anything about Node.js. If you attach GDB to a node process, you just get a bunch of hex addresses for the stack, because it has no idea where anything is. Um, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so, okay, the rest of this I'm going to start talking about some tools and techniques that we use. Uh, and I'm going to start with this one called Kang. So Kang is a, a very a super simple tool slash protocol slash node module for expressing the state of a distributed system. The goal is for it to be a very high level distributed system debugger. And what we actually do with Kang is in your server, whatever it is, you add an HTTP endpoint that spits out a JSON description of whatever objects that thing knows about. And what that is depends entirely on the service. So I mentioned the service that I worked on is a job execution engine. So the thing it's doing is managing jobs. And each job might have thousands of tasks running across the system at once. So each of the services knows about jobs and tasks, and maybe knows about users and requests and things like that. So with Kang, you basically just spit out this JSON file that describes all of these. It's very simple, it's not super scalable, but it's not intended for the things that you're going to have a million of. It's intended for the things that you're going to have a relatively small number of that are important to know about. Then there's a client tool that, that you, to, where you can give it a bunch of IP addresses of servers and say, get me the current Kang snapshot from each of these services, and then you can actually you know, browse that. I'm just going to do a quick demo of that. A talk, um, a talk about a production service wouldn't be complete if I didn't actually log into a production system to do this demo. Oh, very responsible. Please, please work. Okay. Yeah. Very responsible. Okay. So, so I'm in our USC data center and I'm hitting the IP address of uh, one of the Marlin agents. Which is, Marlin is the is the distributed job execution engine I was talking about. And so I'm just going to hit that. This is what you get back. It's intended to be pretty self-describing so that um, in principle you could build a CLI around this that doesn't know anything about the specific servers that you're talking to, but just figures it out from the data. So it's like, okay, well, here we have Marlin, here's the, the identifier for the instance of the service. Um, there's this notion of stats and we've got some basic memory stuff in there, but really it's expected we'll be using some other kind of monitoring system for most of this stuff. Um, we've got some set of types that describe the objects that are here. Um, so this is an agent. Um, which is just a type of component in our system, and it knows about jobs and requests and task groups and task trees and blah, blah, blah. Let's skip over to the end. Um, so here is something which uh, is called a subscription. So here's a class of objects called a subscription, and each of them has some name, and there's a bunch of information about this. So the way this system works is it's a pull-based system, and it actually pulls periodically a database in which we store all the job execution state. And so a lot, you can imagine a lot of problems you might have with this. Maybe, you know, some task is not being picked up by some supervisor that's supposed to be executing it. Or um, some, maybe this thing is being flooded with records and it's not able to keep up with the number of things. And the question is, like, well, what kinds of things would you want to know when you're debugging this thing? Those are the things you export in Kang. So there's a lot of debugging state we have here that is not necessary for the operation of the service, but is just useful to a human who's coming in here trying to figure out what's going on. So in this case, um, this is an example of a query that this thing is running, looking for work that is assigned to it, but it hasn't picked up yet. And we have stuff like the last time we made a query, and the last time we made a query that actually returned some records, and the last number of records that was returned, and stuff like that. This is a continuing theme of, um, this, there's, there was definitely like a, an aha moment for me the first time I saw this, this notion of including state in your program solely for the purpose of being able to debug it later. The program itself is never actually going to use that. Um, that that's going to be helpful. Um, actually, what I want to do, so another thing you can do with Kang, you can use that basic data to build a dashboard. And so this is a dashboard that demonstrates what Manta is, what the compute part of Manta is doing at any given time. So I'm actually going to kick off a job just to, uh, just to have it do something. <coughs> so this is basically just running WC on 4,305 objects pretty simple thing that's just going to run for a little bit. What actually happens when you run this is um, each of these boxes represents a container which we call a zone in which, we are, in which we're going to run a user's program. And so we just lit that up. So each black one is a container in which I'm running WC right now. 
pretty soon some of these are going to start turning yellow. And that, what that's, what's happening there is we're actually halting the container and rolling back the file system and then booting it again for the next tenant. That takes a little while. We have one of them up here. We actually shouldn't see a lot because the whole point of the system is to minimize that. But yeah, we're, we're going to see some of those. Um, and once we do start seeing those, there's another thing I want to show in Kang. Behaving more badly. <laughs> kind of shitty. Um, there we go. Okay. So, another thing that we have here, I, I mentioned we had these zones. And these zones go through a process where they're executing user code, and then at some point we tear them down and we bring them back up again for the next user. That process is kind of complicated. It's like a 10 stage pipeline that we manage from Node.js. And an obvious thing that you might want to look at is like, okay, this zone has been resetting for five minutes. What is it actually doing right now? Um, so for that, we, we actually uh, use a library called VAsync that I wrote. It's similar to async in terms of providing like parallel and series and for each and stuff like that. The difference is instead of being implemented with closures, which are somewhat hard to um, observe from a REPL or a debugger or something like that, it returns to you an object that describes the state of the thing that's in progress. And so you, you can export that over JSON, over Kang, or from a debugger or something like that and see what's going on. So in this case, we've got a pipeline where we've actually done at least the first like five or six stages of this. We've, we've done our own cleanup, we've halted it, we're in the middle of booting it, and we're now in this wait booted state. So we're actually waiting for it to come up. And then the next, um, the next several things are waiting because it's a, it's a pipeline, so those are going to happen after that. Uh, does that make sense? What we're looking at here. So, this is another theme. This is the same theme, actually, of taking, of making as much state as possible observable from a debugger. In this case, it's Kang, but um, there are other cases where it's not going to be Kang, but it's actually going to be a regular debugger. Let's see. Anything else here? So we're talking about VAsync. Okay. So, I want to talk about this example of cloud analytics. Has anyone heard me talk about this before? You might have heard this story before. Cloud analytics is this service where uh, you can come to the joint portal and you can say, I want to go instrument all my node processes across the cloud, or all the Postgres queries that are going on across my fleet. Um, and we will basically go dynamically figure out which servers you're on, instrument those systems, with Postgres or, or the kernel or node or whatever it is, gather that data and bring it, and send it back to you in a UI. So you see this graph and stuff marching to the left, you know, real-time graph. It's great when it works. It's great. Um, of course, I'm talking about a situation where it's not working. So it's about like two hours before we're about to launch this in early 2011. And we're playing around with it and we're watching the graphs, like everything's great. And all of a sudden it just stops. It's like completely stops dead on the screen. It looks like it's frozen. It's like a System 7 Mac from the, from the mid 90s. And you're just like, it's just not moving at all. And it's not like, it's not like broken, it's just not moving. Um, we were able to tell pretty quickly which process on the back end was the problem because we have this fleet of 16 data aggregators, and one of them was not responding to pings at all. That this is like an application level ping. We're basically sending you a message, and it's just like going into a black hole. Nothing's going on. Um, so we get on the box. We're playing around with it. Um, we're trying to figure out what's going on. We're trusting it, which is like S-Trace if you use that. We're looking at system calls that it's doing. It's doing zero system calls. We're looking at CPU usage. It's using 100% of the core. That's actually pretty impressive. You can actually, it's very hard to do anything interesting in the program and do zero system calls. Because you're not talking to anyone, you're not taking any input, you're not producing any output, you're just using CPU to do who knows what. Um, eventually we had, um, we had Ryan Dahl in the room, creator of Node.js, author of all the stuff, he was leading the project at the time. I was there who had written the program that we were trying to debug. Brian was there as the kernel engineer who had written Dtrace and a bunch of other observability tools. And we had no idea how to figure out the first thing about what this program was doing. I didn't even know how to say, I didn't even know what log message I could add to this thing in hopes that if we hit this again, we will have some clue what it's doing. Because it's like, well, I have no idea where it is. It could be receiving data from this client, it could be generating data for this other client, it could be doing anything. Um, uh, for a while, when we first gave this, a talk like this, there was, we didn't have an answer to that question. Um, we, were, we were hosed and we didn't know why. And we were taking bets on how soon was it going to be before we see this problem again. This was like two hours before production, so it's like, obviously we're going to see this within 10 minutes of going to production. Someone was like, well, it'll probably go like 12, 24 hours. I think I was saying at the off chance it'll be like, maybe, like within the first month, certainly we'll hit this problem again. 
We didn't have this problem again for six months at the time when Brian was demoing it to our CEO at the time. So also a lesson, just because something is infrequent doesn't mean it's not extremely expensive when it happens. Um, anyway, that, that was kind of a problem. How do we actually solve this? Well, at the time, you know, we, we came from a C background, so we were like, well, we'll save a core file of this process in hopes that one day we'll be able to figure it out. And by the time we actually hit it again six months later, we had developed some tooling around being able to play around with core files and make sense of what's going on in that core file, which is tricky because, as I was talking about before, debuggers generally don't know anything about V8. And so I'll just pull up the core file. So this is, um, I'm going to pull up what I think is the actual core file that we saw. <coughs> So this is what you would normally get in a debugger. MDB syntax is a little weird, so you just squint a little bit. Well, I run this clone clone stack command and it just gives you a bunch of hex addresses. The reason, of course, is that um, V8 has just compiled your JavaScript code to these anonymous regions somewhere in the heap. And the debugger has no idea what those functions correspond to. So if you just ask it for a stack trace, it's like, well, I see the instruction pointers over here, but I can't give you a name for that. What we did was we built a, a module for our modular debugger. It supports pluggable modules. We built one that understands V8. This one's cranky because this core file is so old that it's basically like, I don't know what the heck I'm looking at. But it actually does have enough to make sense of this. And then we have this command called JSTack. And what this does is for each of those frames, it's actually able to annotate it with what JavaScript function was there. Um, and then you can do JSTack minus V. And it actually can also give you the arguments to each of those functions. This was huge, right? When we saw this problem again, we, we took the core file, we opened it up in NDB, and we found that we were in exports.bucket tags. This function happens to be a stateless function. So it just takes a couple of uh, arguments. This is a, a request that's, ironically, it's, it's this performance service, and it's trying to serve a request that this, it's trying to basically draw a heat map from some y-axis value to some um, minimum and maximum y-axis value over some domain. And we take a look at the argument to this function, have you guys seen this before at all? I don't know if this is made it around or anything, but you'll notice that min <coughs> equals max. In this particular case, the code just went into an infinite loop. It just wasn't checking arguments properly and just like went to town on the CPU. And it's, it's all over. We had no way of figuring that out, which is part of why we ended up building these tools. Um, but the, the point was, once we actually had built the tool, we were able to go to root cause on this problem in like 20 seconds. It's like, open up the thing. We've actually got a completely reproducible test case because we have both of these arguments. So this is the um, this is the actual input data that it was getting, and we have the parameters to this thing. And it's like, sure enough, you feed that to that function, and it just goes into random. So we started using core files for debugging these these non-fatal problems, these correctness problems. How many people here have actually debugged with core files before? By the way, I don't know what they are. So basically, they, they come from a C world where when your program crashes, the system will be configured to actually save a dump of all of memory for that program to a file. That's a core dump. And it ha it's kind of like the black box on an airplane. It has all the information you could possibly want to be able to solve the problem, uh, to, to be able to figure out why that thing actually crashed. But you can also create a core file of a running process without killing it with a command called gcore. So we actually do this all the time. This is actually the main way that I debug Node both in production and in development because um, I'll actually switch to a more interesting core file. Over here, I've got a core file of the Marlin agent from a case where it actually blew an assertion. So we've actually configured Node to also dump core when it gets an uncaught exception. So we actually have a core file for every Node crash that happens in production for us. Um, Unfortunately, prior to O10, O10.8, the way we were doing this was on an uncaught exception handler, after which point the stack is completely unwound. So you don't actually have the arguments and stuff where, um, where the thing crashed. But what we do have is a command called findjs objects, which given a property name, and I'm just going to use one that I know happens to be there, will find to you, will give you back a pointer to an object that has that property. And in fact, if you have multiple such objects, it'll, it'll make all those available to you. But it bucketizes them according to their properties, and I'll show that in a second. But what that means is that, um, in this case, I know that all of my services state is hanging off this object that has all these fields called MA whatever, because it's the modeling agent, one of which is MA task groups. So I can print, so if I find that object, I found all of my state. 
For that, I can do JS print, and this is basically all of the state for the agent that manages job execution. And it's, you know, we have all these properties in here. It's not quite as good as when you're in the node debugger and you can just like print some variable and it's just like all there. Um, although for the most part, we can basically get all that information. The syntax is just a little bit more awkward. And um, we actually had a hackathon last week where I was working on a project to make the syntax a little bit more natural for, for node developers, but um, it's not quite polished enough to really show. But let's see. Um, so in this particular dump, we had a situation where that, that those, I was talking about those zones in which we run uh, users' tasks. The set of tasks that we run in the zone, we call that a task stream because it's kind of this thing that we're constantly appending to. And when the stream runs out of tasks, then we clean up the zone. And we, we actually clean up the stream. This dump was an assertion failure in the cleanup code that was saying assert that the stream that's there is actually in some global variable that references all the streams, right? It should be there. Otherwise, we either clean this thing up twice or we never actually initialized it properly in the first place. That, so that was the assertion that we blew that caused this core dump. So with this, um, if I was able to find So here I was able to actually find the set of streams. There's only three of them in this dump, and none of them corresponded to the one that wasn't there, which makes sense. Oh, the other thing I, I should have shown was in the JSTAC we have the panic thing. We actually have the error object that we dumped on, and it was an assertion error, and we were asserting that something was equal to something else. The thing was actually undefined, and we were expecting it to be this string here. And sure enough, it's not in the global state. This is a very different way of debugging than I think a lot of people are used to, so at least in the node world, because um, I think a lot of, you know, you tend to do this thing where you, you'll add print statements or you'll find some way of getting additional information and reproducing the problem. But the core dump, it only happened once. And in fact, those are, those are sort of the most interesting and, and hardest problems. It's like this thing only happened once, but there's no reason it's not going to happen again, and I still want to be able to solve it. So what you end up doing is you create a hypothesis, and then you figure out ways of testing that hypothesis. So you say, well, either this thing was, initial, was cleaned up twice or, or was never fully initialized. In each of those cases, you can find other evidence in the core file that either refutes or confirms that theory. And you do that, you go far enough down that and you say, okay, yes, this is obviously what happened here, and the fix should be to do this. One of the most satisfying things is when you say, when you, you get a core file for some really obscure thing, and you're like, surely this couldn't have happened. This could only happen if like these five things happened before it. And you try those five things, and boom, it dies in exactly that way. It's just like so satisfying. You're like, I've actually proved this is exactly what happened. This thing that seemed so opaque when I started. Anyway, um, so we use core files a lot for both um, development and production of both fatal failures and non-fatal failures, when something is just doing the wrong thing. The problem I alluded to earlier is one of those where we had a situation where something had not done a DNS resolution, and so we had redeployed some other service, the IP address changed, and it was trying to contact the wrong service. Um, that was hard to see with the logging that we had. But with the core file, it was very clear, right? You go into the client, you look at what it's actually, what it actually thinks the IP addresses of this thing are. Uh, in some cases, not in that particular case, but in some cases, you can actually save a timestamp of the last time you resolved this thing, and it's just like smoking gun. It's great. All right. Let's see. That's how you configure cores. Um, with 0.10.8 and later, there's an abort on uncon exception flag which will cause V8 to actually call the abort libc function, which dumps core, at the moment that you throw an exception that is not going to be caught. It is it? huge. Yeah. Is there something like gcore for OSX? I don't know about OSX. That's okay. Probably, though, because I think the Linux version of gcore actually just runs gdb and then runs whatever the gdb command is to save core. And OSX has gdb, so we okay. should be able to do that. Cool. Uh, um, Talk about this. All right, I want to talk briefly about heap analysis. So, how many people who it seems like everyone here has used Node? How many people have had memory problems with Node processes? Okay, good number of people. Some people obviously haven't run into that yet, but will. <laughs> um, this is a, a huge problem with dynamic environments, right? You don't have to worry about um, allocating and freeing, but you do have this problem with accidentally holding on to memory. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the talk that TJ did a week or two ago about the Walmart memory leak. That was a real, that ended up being a leak in the native heap 
but it was related to Node, ended up being a bug in Node. And um, these problems can be particularly nasty because you, you set up all these abstractions and infrastructure so that we don't have to think about this thing. But um, as Matt Randy likes to say, if it works magically, it breaks magically. It's very hard to actually understand when these things go wrong, and that one's particularly nasty. What we have, so all of the memory inspection tools I've ever seen for dynamic languages are pretty weak, and so I'm throwing that out there. But what we do have is FindJS objects. What FindJS object does is it actually iterates all of the memory that you can find in the core dump that you're looking at, or the process you're looking at. Identifies all the heap objects that it can, figures out what type they are and what properties they have, and categorizes them by those properties, by the, by the number and types of those properties. So what that means, so by the time you get to the bottom of the list, you have, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's actually sorted by frequency count, it looks like it's sorted by, no, it's not a number of properties, but. Um, the second column here, oh, backing up, the first column is a representative object from this category. This last column is a description of that category. So these are objects that have a func name, result, status, function, error property. Um, and this is the number of the properties that it has, and this is the number of such objects. This actually works pretty well if you've got a really bad leak. If, you've leaked, if you are um, running a process that's doing, I don't know, 10,000 requests a second, and you see like 200,000 of some object down there, and you take a look at the core file an hour later, and it's like 300,000 objects down there, you can be pretty sure that's a need. And it's actually really helpful that this thing can tell you basically what type of thing that is. And importantly, remember the first principles here. We want to be non-disruptive to production, but we still want to have all this information. The fact that we're using a core file means that we can do this sort of expensive analysis after the fact. We save a core file, the process is still running in production, and we can do this really expensive computation of finding all these objects and categorizing them and stuff like that. Um, and we didn't have to enable anything special. So I know that there, there are some modes of V8 which will track some of this stuff. And I, I actually haven't measured it, so I don't know what the performance impact is. But the impression that I've got from talking to people is it's not the kind of thing you run in production. And once you turn it on, you can't really turn it back off again. So that's, that makes it kind of a non starter from our perspective. At least for production. For development, it's great. If you can reproduce the problem in development, that's awesome. Um, but that never happens. So you take any of these, let's see. So if you do find JS objects again, that actually iterates all of the things that look like that. So I, I just gave it a representative object and then asked it to iterate all the actual objects that look like that. So this, uh, ironically, I was running the same job that I was just running a few minutes ago. This is a recent job. Anyway. So that's that's a, one element of JavaScript keep analysis you know, Okay. So I've been talking a lot about debugging from static snapshots. I talked about Kang, which is a very cheap way of getting information that you knew ahead of time you were going to want. And I talked about core files, which is a way of getting ev absolutely everything you want, but it takes a little bit longer. It's a little bit more annoying. You have to like take you have to do gcore. You have to copy that file somewhere. You can run into view. But static state isn't always enough. Sometimes you need to understand how a program is actually executed. What, what is it actually doing when it's running? And so there's this basic idea that, um, well, I'm going to add console.log, and I'm going to restart it, and I'm going to try it again. And then we've talked about why that's problematic. Um, but it's a good idea, right? What you want to do is essentially get more information about what it did, and then try and reproduce the problem. So what are ways we can do that? One way we do that is we use a logging library called Bunyan. Bunyan was written by um, Trent Mick, who also works at Joint. Um, and it's very simple, new line separated JSON for each of the log entries. But one of the really cool things it has is this, is this one called bunny minus p. And what this lets you do is take a process in which you set the log level to something like um, info. Like it's sort of a standard level thing, right? You set it to info, anything at debug or lower is not going to get printed, everything at info and higher is going to get printed. But you can actually walk up to a production process and do bunny minus p pid, and it will spit out all the log entries even the debug ones that are turned off in that process. And it doesn't require any special support from that process. Um, Bunyan has a very little bit of glue built in. I'll talk about how it works in a second. But just to give you a sense of what I mean, um, let's open up a REPL here. So I'm requiring Bunyan. I'm going to create a log. at level info. So we see the message printed out to standard out. That's the actual log message in JSON. 
And if I change that to debug, you won't see it. All right, makes sense? In this, uh, now I'm going to get hit. In this other shell over here, I'm going to do bunny minus p of that pid. And now again, I'll do info, and I actually, I got the info message. That sort of makes sense. It's actually kind of magical how that works alone, but OK, fine, that makes sense. And it's actually formatting it because that's what the bunny tool actually does. But then I can also do debug, and of course, we actually can see it. This is huge when you walk up to a production system. And the other thing is that the log, the debug message is not going to your main log. So if you're worried about disk I.O. or something like that, that's not going to be a problem with this mechanism. What you might see is potential drops, but um, it's not going to do a lot of either of this. So, Bunyan, so we use Bunyan as our logging library for basically everything in JPC and Manta. And, um, and we use Bunyan minus P really, really frequently. So actually, it's that pretty sweet. So I'm actually logged in over here. This isn't production. This is a, an instance of Smart Data Center that's running on my laptop. And you can actually give it, you can actually tell it to watch everything. And it'll just print out everything from all processes. And so we're seeing stuff at Trace and Debug or whatever that's just way too expensive for us to be printing it all the time. But if you have a reproducible test case, it's really good. So how does this thing actually work? <laughs> I mean, have people here heard of Dtrace, use Dtrace? It's on your Mac. Um, this is like the Dtrace, I think I don't know if this is the Dtrace logo or the Dtrace.com logo, because Dtrace is the bony corn. And um, you might be wondering what it's doing in that turtle. The turtle's fine. It's actually just X-ray vision. <laughs> the turtle's your slow program. It's X-ray vision. The turtle is fine. It's not damaged or anything. Um, but anyway, so, so that's D-Trace. The way D-Trace works is the system provides some number of probes. And on a typical production system, we've got about 75,000 probes. And these can be anything on the system, ranging from um, you know, we issued an I.O. to disk, to we took a thread off CPU or on CPU or put it on a run queue, or uh, this process did the system call, or application level stuff. So we put probes into node for HTTP requests start and end, and for garbage collection start and end. So these probes can be basically anything, and you can add your own. With each probe, you take some action, and that can be collect a certain piece of information, printf, I got here, uh, whatever you put in console.log, um, grab a stack trace. You can actually do kind of crazy things like you can cause a process to dump core at the moment that it's a probe. That's destructive. Um, I mean, it's labeled a destructive action for obvious reasons, but it actually is incredibly useful. I was debugging a node bug a couple weeks ago where if fork failed under certain conditions, if you were also using a custom string for the standard in or standard out for the process, node would actually, libuv would close the file descriptor for your custom stream. Um, and then it would try to use it later and get ebatf if you were lucky and data corruption in the wrong file descriptor if you were unlucky. But one of the things that was really useful for figuring this out was I, I just traced syscalls that returned negative, uh, I play, yeah, I traced the closed syscall returning negative one where error node equals ebatf for processes called node across the whole system and at that moment I triggered a core dump and then I had a dump of the exact stack trace that was mentioned. That was actually slightly after it had already gone haywire but um, was close enough to get to the the problem. Destructive actions aside, Dtrace is intended for production use. That's the first principle. Do no harm. So um, it's intended to be safe. It doesn't. That's why uh, I was talking to someone earlier. It's not the language in which you describe these actions is not Turing complete. It doesn't allow you to encode a loop because if you did, um, you could do really bad things to the system. You, and um, it's, it's intended to be able to instrument the whole system. It can instrument high-level interrupt handlers and page fault handlers, which means you can't do things that are going to trigger a page fault or cause a page fault to take a really long time. Um, but it's also dynamic, so it has zero overhead when it's not enabled, and minimal overhead when it is. Um, so you, let's see. So on this system, so you can detrace minus L to list the probes. And on this system, we've got almost 75,000. Let's see. So I'm actually going to jump straight into, oh yeah, I'm going to jump into the node. So I wrote this tool called NHTDP SNOOP. And what this thing does is, by default, it traces Node.js uh, server activities. I'm actually just going to write it. Remember, I'm running this on a machine that is running all the smart data center. So I've got 100 node processes running on this box. So we're probably going to see a lot of stuff. Most of those are HTTP, some kind of 
And what this thing is doing is it's using Dtrace. So when I ran an HTTP script, that script actually generated a Dscript and then ran a Dtrace to instrument the HTTP request start and done probes in Node for all the servers on the entire system. And so these were previously basically NOPs in that process. The, like, the instruction literally was just like NOP. And now it does a quick trap into the kernel, grabs the information if you want, and then um, the, the process moves on. So it's very quick. It's much faster than when it trusts or something like that. Uh, let's see. You can also ask it for client and garbage collection, for client requests and garbage collection information so you can see uh, other stuff that's going on. And just to give you a sense of uh, what this actually looks like in D. Let's see, all the method path. So we do dash n, and this is the D script. So this is like, this is a small taste of D. D is the language in which you write D trace scripts. Um, we have, and it's, it's like off. So you have these events, and then you have the things that you do with those events. So there's a begin event, you print a header. On HTTP server requests for all node processes, we're gathering the timestamp, the current method, and the URL, and we're saving it in an associative array just so we can keep track of which one this is for concurrency. And then on the response, we're printing that out as well. We're just printing out the information we saved along with the latency. So those are the probes that are built into Node, but you can also add your own probes to Node, to your Node application, and we do this really extensively. And you can also do this in a library. So this is actually how bunion minus p works. Bunion minus p has a single dtrace probe in it when it, at the very point where it's making the decision about whether to log that thing to disk or just drop it, it just fires the dtrace probe. So on a normal system, when, that's, when you haven't enabled it, it just goes ahead and drops that, and then it literally doesn't do anything for that, that uh, dtrace probe. When you enable dtrace, you're, you're taking a quick trap into the kernel, it's saving, it's copying in the string that, is, that denotes the log entry, and then going right back up to the join it. And making that available to the Dtrace consumer later. That's how bunion minus p works. Um, let's see. For all of our REST services, we use a library called RESTify, which is written by Mark Cabbage to join. And one of the cool, it's, it's, it's similar to Express in that you define some routes and you have a bunch of handlers and they just go in order. Uh, but one of the cool things he did was he added Dtrace probes to the start and end of each route, as well as each handler. So if you, if by, simply by virtue of using RESTify, get a bunch of Dtrace probes pro for free. So I'm going to run this Restify Snoop um, script, which is very similar to the one that we just looked at for Node probes, but it uses the Restify probes. And now I'm going to kick off a request that we'll hopefully see. So I just ran this list VMs command from our, Mac, our VM API server. And so what we can see here is we saw the, the actual request start, and then these are all the handlers that we do as part of that request. We do a bunch of stuff. I don't know, I don't know exactly what these do, but we're, we're parsing various parts of the, the header and the body, and I don't know, proxy stuff is doing. We talk to our workflow API, and eventually we finally actually load, we list the VMs, which it looks like, according to this, we do after loading the VM, but I think that would be helpful. Of course, we can see how much time we spent each of these as well, and obviously one of those is much bigger than all the others. Another thing we do a lot is we use dtrace aggregations. So, an important principle for something like dtrace, which is intended to instrument like hundreds of thousands of events per second on a system, is that you're not emitting that datum for every single event that happens. You're you're aggregating it at the source of the data. So, in this case, we have a script that looks very very similar, but instead of printing something out for each one. We're just going to save information about the latency of each one. Now I'm going to run that request again. What we get now is a histogram, both the routes and handlers. So with the route histogram, what we have here, this is basically latency, and then the height of the bar here is how many requests fell into that bucket. So in this case, we have one request for each of these, and you can basically see the exact latency. This one had 14 requests, and you can see the distribution of those latencies. And then we can do the same thing with the handlers, which are part of each request. And we can see very clearly which one of the list VMs ones is taking so long. Which is kind of cool. So let's see. I was worried I wasn't going to have the Wi-Fi to do this, so I have all these examples in here. Yeah, you can also trace 
Um, it, you'd be surprised how useful it is to trace system elements as part of understanding a node problem. So, um, you know, if you're doing, if you're working with a node add-on that malloc's memory and it calls new, you're going to end up calling your, you're probably going to end up calling malloc or esper at some point. So one way of finding leaks, a totally different approach to finding memory leaks, is actually just tracing the spot where you allocate memory, or in this case, even the spot where where the heap is forced to grow, which isn't even every allocation. It's just the allocations that are pushing you over some threshold, and then grabbing a stack trace at that point. And if you sample that and you've got enough of those things, you can actually figure out what what things you can use. Um, one of the most interesting things to a node user is actually the time you're off CPU, especially if you're off on the main thread. Um, so it's useful to instrument the scheduler and say, when am I being taken off CPU and why? What is the what is the what is my stack? And am I being taken off because I'm going to sleep because I called something that blocks, which would be really bad, or am I going to sleep because there's another tenant on my cloud and he needs a CPU right now and I'm just being ripped off the CPU, whatever. So um, when you have that information, it's, it's pretty useful. But it's, it's not something a lot of people think. So you can have a non-destructively in a stack trace. Yes. Yes. Right. Process running. Yeah. Nothing cool. Yeah, it's very tricky how that actually happens. But um, essentially what we do is when you build V8, we, we wrote a chunk of code in D that gets glommed onto the V8 binary. And when V8 loads up, we IOPL that down to the kernel. And then the kernel knows if you ever use the stack trace action in D trace, it knows that there's a helper for this, is what we call it. It's a block of code. It basically teaches the kernel how to get a stack trace for a new program. And basically executes that. Gosh, I'll just, uh, actually, I was going to do that in a second anyway. So, when you want to profile a node program, um, this is an easy way to do it with dtrace. So, this is a profile probe that fires 97 times a second, and uh, we just do that to avoid periodic activity that happens on the 100 milliseconds or whatever, or 10 milliseconds. And I'm predicating on this being the process that I care about. I'm grabbing a stack trace and I'm um, aggregating, I'm doing a frequency count of that indexed by the stack trace. So in other words, I'm grabbing a stack trace, but I'm not emitting it every time, I'm seeing how many times I saw each one. And I'll just do that on the system. Just to show you what it looks like. So I, I've instrumented something that's going to fire 100 times a second, and each time it's going to grab a stack trace. Do some work over here, so hopefully we actually get the samples. And then it just spits the output out. With no, so this is a combined C and JavaScript stack trace. So we have main at the bottom, as we would expect, because everything happens basically in main. We have some C++ functions in V8, and then we have a bunch of functions in JavaScript. Um, and then we actually go back into Plus plus, and we're in copy. Because that's where everything is all the time. Is, is there any way to make the C plus plus names a little less confusing? Yes. Um, there's a thing called C plus plus C plus plus filter, right? Um, I usually run the output through C plus plus filter, which basically demands the names. I'm going to actually show that in a second. So, unfortunately, I only grabbed one sample that whole time because this thing must not have been doing that much work. But if you imagine that you've been tracing this for a long time and the thing has actually been on the CPU quite a bit, you're going to have a lot of samples. And then the question becomes, well, how do you actually make sense of that? I've got you know, hundreds of different stack traces, maybe thousands, and they all happen a different number of times. Um, for that, we use a visualization from Brendan and Greg, um, where we just call a flame graph. And a flame graph basically is, what we do is, I'm just going to switch to it. It's a little hard to explain, but it actually makes a lot of sense once you understand. So the, the y-axis here, if you will, is the percentage of samples that had a given stack trace. X-axis, sorry. The y-axis is the actual stack, and it's depth in the stack. So in this case, basically all of the stacks had um, underbar start, which is in the linker, main, and then node start, UV run, UV run up to, with two underbars. Um, and then some of them, which I think it's like 15%, went into UV run idle, and then 85% of them went into UV adult penance. And then that goes on all the way up. When we highlight things that are dark or things where you actually spend a lot of time there, as opposed to one of the things that are called. Like we spent all our time in main because all the samples were in main, but you weren't actually in main, you were in the functions of main call. 
Whereas over here, um, I think that one is read. Um, yeah, that's read. You actually spend all that time in read. And, and we know that because it's a leaf in the stack, but you could also look at this one over here, which is um, V8's internal incremental marking stack function, where it did call a bunch of other functions, but it also spent a lot of time doing stuff in that function. So this is how we understand the performance of node programs when they're stuck on CPU, which is not all the time. If they're not stuck on CPU, the asynchronous operations are much more interesting because that's where your latency is coming from in most cases. But if you are stuck on CPU, this is a really good way of figuring out what you're doing all that time. We've been playing with different ways of visualizing this. So this is kind of this is the latest iteration using a D3-based point graph. And you can click on one of these silos and get a zoomed version of just that. Just something useful. And in this case, um, we're spending a lot of our time in this on message, which I guess makes sense because that's where we're doing a lot of our work. Uh, and this one was not actually on CPU though. So here we're in the list of the ends. Does that make sense, the visualization though? Right. Talk about the off CPU performance. Okay. Um, this was just kind of a collection of tips, most of which I think I've already talked about. Um, for, our, for debugging, we tend to hang all of our state off of some global singleton because once you find that object in a debugger or a Kang or whatever it is, you have everything that you might possibly need, which is great. And we store a bunch of extra state that we would only use for debugging. You might have also noticed these prefixes. Part of that is just because we're crotchety old school C people, but it actually does help with things like rep and with the debugger. Because when you have, um, if you imagine a debugger that's looking at the JavaScript heap, we don't actually know what the global context is. All we know is all the objects in the heap. If you want to find any object, you need to tell me something about it, and I'll find objects that match that criteria. So we can find it by property name or by constructor name. But it's really helpful if the property name is somewhat unique. Otherwise, you just have too much noise. So that's good. Um, and the one I didn't talk about is this f no omit frame pointer. And a lot of compilers by default do dash f omit frame pointer, which I think is really dubious. I don't know that I've ever seen any numbers published that suggest the performance of that is even slightly better. And if you don't use it, the idea is this causes it to not use um, the frame pointer register for the frame pointer, which theoretically makes another register available. The stack on x86 is super fast anyway. I'm clear if that's valuable. But what it does do is it breaks basically every debugger on the planet. You can't use debuggers to get stack traces. You can't use dtrace to get a stack trace. And so even if it's buying you a few percent performance boost, um, it's hard to convey how significant it is to not be able to, to get any more performance wins because you can't see what the thing is actually doing. Um, that's, that's not necessarily a good trade off. Anyway, if you can possibly turn it off. We do compile everything with no other framework. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more if people are interested, but I'm, I'm basically going to skip it for now. But we do a lot of log analysis with this Manta system. So we, um, we upload all the services in Manta and now in SDC. Log, upload all of their logs hourly to Manta itself. And this is actually how we do billing for Manta. We upload the, the, the logs from the front end services and the other services that do global operations. And then we run compute jobs on those logs in Manta and do people's bills. Um, that's kind of cool. We pay for those. We pay for those. But um, we also do a lot of ad hoc stuff that way. So I'll find some error message. I'll be debugging something and I see some error message. And I'm like, huh, I wonder if we've seen this before. I can actually just go through all the old logs and do rep on it and figure out if you've seen that before. So just a note about the platform. So all of the stuff I showed, I was demoing on our operating system, which is called SmartOS. SmartOS is a distribution of Illumos, which is a Unix-like operating system, but it's not Linux. Um, most of these tools are not exactly available on Linux. Um, but it is what it is. We don't use the operating system because it's our operating system. We have our own operating system because these things are important to us. So I know it sounds a little bit like a pitch, but I'm, I'm just you know, explaining. We, we do use SmartOS. Um, TJ is working on reading Linux cores in MDB, and I think has that pretty close to working, which would be pretty sweet. Um, but apparently, not, those cores are incomplete by default in a lot yeah. of cases. Yeah. So uh, there's some challenges around that. Um, Dtrace is on OS X, it's on BSD. There are some ports to Linux. Um, I don't think any of them have JavaScript support. And the experience I've heard with them has not been good, but I, I don't want to be spreading fights, so it's, it's worth trying. Um, 
And the JavaScript stack stuff, unfortunately, doesn't work on OS X. If you have an Apple developer liaison, please tell me. I really want to get them to fix this bug. And everyone I've talked to just says, yeah, file a radar bug, and you know, enough of those get filed, maybe, maybe you'll think about fixing it. But if you have a liaison, I guess that's like 10 points or something. I don't know. Um, that would be great. These modules work everywhere. They just don't, um, like, bunion minus p is not going to work on a system that doesn't have p-trace, but you can start to throw on the ACLG bunion, um, did a rest of the They Can you take p-trace on EC2? I don't think so, because you're on the next step, right? If, you, if you're running a Lumos there, yes, that is possible. So it's strictly operating system. It's not, it doesn't worry about hypervisor or any of that kind of stuff. That's right. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I managed to do that much faster than I thought it would, but probably still took quite a while. Um, I ended up covering some of the, the fatal failures, the non-fatal failures, um, some of the performance aspects, and a little bit of the memory analysis. I didn't end up talking about native keep analysis stuff. It's pretty interesting. TJ got a real good crash course in it, and we used to go with Walmart stuff. Um, but I'll talk about it if people are interested. Otherwise, I'll just call that. So, thanks. JavaScript add-on to um, the button that allows it to, uh, yep. to debug all 
Yes. Yeah. It's actually in, it's included in Node's source code now, so it's a little easier to find. So if you go into the master branch of Node, under Depths, it'll be MDB under bar Oh, okay. The hard part is having the, the MDB part. <laughs> that doesn't, that's the issue. Any other questions? Thanks, man. Cool. Thank you.